Hi there, it's producer Rob here. Now, maybe you're a new listener, maybe you've been listening for ages. Well, either way, if you're finding this podcast useful, then you might also like to subscribe to Which Money. You'll get our monthly magazine packed with tips on how to make the most of your cash, from growing your savings and investments to avoiding rip-offs and scams. You'll also be able to call our experts on the Which Money helpline as often as you like to get answers to your money queries. Just visit which.co.uk forward slash join money. That's which.co.uk forward slash join money. And sign up today. When life gives you questions, which get answers. Welcome to the Which Money podcast, your weekly hit of money news and personal finance hacks to help make you better off. I'm your host, Lucia Ariano, and here's what's coming up this week. very first thing is to think about your why for investing. What's the purpose behind investing? Once you're clear on what that thing is, you then need to set a very clear goal. Well, if you have financial goals and you want to reach them faster, sooner rather than later, then we'd say that investing in the stock market is a great way of doing that. If you've decided you're ready to invest and you want specifically to pick an ethical fund, you'll find hundreds of funds saying they are green, they're responsible, they're sustainable. So you'll see all these funds with all these words attached, but they kind of don't mean anything at the moment. By the time you're listening to today's episode, the Bank of England will have made their decision on whether to change the base rate, something which will have some pretty big consequences for our savings, mortgages and plenty more. But regardless of what happens, could investing your cash be the most effective way to see the best returns on your finances? Today on the show, we're talking investing and in particular for beginners, showing you where to start, steps to follow and plenty of do's and don'ts as you start your investing journey. And to do that, I'm pleased to say we're joined by two brilliant guests. They are Ken and Mary Okorafo, the award-winning founders of The Humble Penny and authors of the number one best-selling book, Financial Joy, which is a 10-week plan to help you banish debt, grow your money and unlock financial freedom. Wow, so much. They're with me today. Hello, both. Hello. 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 Well, thank you so, so much for joining us. I'm so excited to have you on the show. And I should also say we'll be hearing from which is very own investing expert, Megan Thomas, a bit later on in the show. But Ken and Mary, starting with you, you. Tell us a bit about The Humble Penny and how it all started. Okay, so The Humble Penny began life as a side project alongside our day jobs. So we had our corporate jobs and back in 2017 we wanted to do something that was that offered us a way to give back in some other capacity outside of our jobs. I used to work as a chief financial officer in the venture capital business and I wanted to try something a bit more creative. So it began as a 99p blog They essentially aim to help people who are starting from small beginnings to start to learn about money in a much more relatable and simple way. And I have to say, I've been reading about your story and, you know, some pretty inspirational stuff you've managed to achieve. One thing that stood out for me um, as a mortgage owner uh, was being mortgage free in seven years from a 25 year mortgage. I mean, that just sounds incredible, mind blowing. And given we're talking about investing today, how has investing played a role in this journey? Investing has played a major role on, in our journey. Uh, we began properly investing in 2010. Back then, for us anyway, investing wasn't really something that people we knew of knew what they were doing with investing. Mm. So we started off by investing in some individual stocks for ourselves and our children uh, back then. And then after losing some money, as well as making some money, we gradually learned uh, that there's another way to invest money without actually you know, giving ourselves the best chance of investing. So we explored the likes of passive investing, so investing in index funds and exchange traded funds. And that became our main focus as a, an approach or a strategy over the next 10 years. We are primary focus on the S&P 500. We focused on the US equities markets and then gradually started to invest more globally. Yeah, and throughout our journey, even though we were focused on paying off our mortgage, we also still invested in the stock market. And so um, the percentages we invested varied over the years and titled more towards the mortgage overpayments as we got closer to our goal. But now, though, given that we're 100% mortgage-free, um, a large portion of our disposable income has gone in towards investing into the stock market. There are lots of things I want to ask you about what you just said there, but let's rewind a bit and make a start on investing. So for anyone totally new, what are the reasons our listeners might choose investing over a traditional savings method like a savings account or an ISA? 
Well, if you have financial goals and you want to reach them faster, sooner rather than later, then we'd say that investing in the stock market is a great way of doing that because it buys you ownership within companies and it means that your money is working 24 seven, you know, seven days a week, basically. In addition to that, investing your money in the stock market gives you that opportunity to actually beat inflation potentially, because when you leave your money in a bank account, it loses value, loses purchasing power effectively. And also it's been known that investing in stocks is effectively is owning assets in a company, owning a part of a company, over time gives you an above average return compared to other asset classes. So when you combine all those three reasons, quite a compelling reason to invest your money rather than just leave it in your current account or savings account, for example. Now, a very important question, I think, who can invest? Because mm. people may understandably assume you need lots of extra income yeah. or plenty of savings to even think about investing. And, you know, that it's something basically for the rich. Mm. Mm. There's a lot of misconceptions about investing, actually. Um, some of the most common misconceptions are that you need to be an expert mm -hmm. or that you need a lot of money and mm -hmm. so therefore only the rich can invest or that investing is gambling. So due to a lot of these misconceptions, it means that a lot of people are yeah. not actually investing. We interviewed our community over at YouTube and 49% out of the thousands of people yeah. um, we, we surveyed said that one of the biggest financial mistakes was actually not investing sooner enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And the thing about investing that we've learned is that you can begin with as little as 20 pounds a month, for example. Or even less. Even less than that. Yeah. So this is something that's completely accessible to anybody at different budget levels, at different income levels. And the key thing is actually overcoming that initial fear and mm. getting started today. So important. And I should say, you know, as a general rule of thumb, we often say at which just to cover yourself, you do need to have an emergency savings in place yes. first. And we say three months worth mm. is a good amount. So let's say you've got your emergency fund and you've mm. made the decision you want to take the plunge. What's next? Where should you start? Because it can seem like a very daunting task. You know, you've mentioned fear uh, when you first get started. OK, so. Let's take a step back a little bit. I'm going to mm -hmm. share 10 quick steps that will help us on this journey of getting started Great. with investing. The very first thing is to think about your why for investing. What's the purpose behind investing? It's not because it's trendy or it's fun or you've seen some advert that's making you want to start investing. It's very important to be clear. For example, you might say, I'm investing because I one day want that financial freedom or I want to plan for my retirement. Once you're clear on what that thing is, you then need to set a very clear goal. A goal could be, I want to build an investment portfolio of £500,000 in the next 10 years for my retirement, for example. Or it could be other goals, but the key things for it to be clear and have some kind of deadline. Then you need a strategy, which is an approach. Which way are you going to go about doing this? You might hear a lot of noise in the media about trading, which is where you buy and sell aiming for a profit. But we'd suggest a passive investing strategy, which focuses on effectively investing your money broadly in passive funds, so index funds and exchange traded funds, but at low cost. That way you reduce your risk as much as possible, giving yourself the best chance of making a return. Step four is then to choose a platform. You need a place to begin this journey of investing. This is where you're going to be able to um, pick a platform that works for you. Different platforms appeal to different people because they have different products uh, and so on that people might choose to invest in. So we, for example, and I'm not sh I'm not sure if it's okay to mention this, but we invest personally with the likes of uh, Vanguard and Hargreaves Lansdowne. Mm -hmm. But there are many platforms out there for different people at different amounts of money that they have mm -hmm. in terms of their investing amount. Next is then to choose for yourself a tax efficient account because you're going to need some things like a, opening a bank account. So here I'm talking about your stocks and shares ISA, for example, or your lifetime ISA, or even your self-invested personal pension, a SIP and so on, or a general investing account. After that, you need to choose an amount to start investing. So as we mentioned previously, you can start with a small amount of money, for example, £20 or £50 a month or whatever matches your budget. Then step seven is then to choose what to invest that money mm. in. So it could be an index fund, an ETF, could be position to uh, look at a particular marketplace like the UK or the US or a global fund, for example. Next is then to aim to keep your costs low because costs absolutely smash your, almost reduce the, the performance, almost create a drag on 
the potential of your portfolio for the future. So you want a low cost fund, ideally something below 0.5% over time, ideally. Uh, and then number nine would then be to automate your investing. There's no point in doing it once and mm-hmm. forgetting about it. You want to automate it so that you're almost paying yourself first and that money comes out and it's you, know, you feel confident that you're planning for the future. And then the final one's a cheeky one. Head over and check out our book, over at finan- hey. uh, titled Financial Joy. Um, it's, it's a 10-week plan, like you mentioned, that we created to help you banish that, grow your money, and unlock financial freedom. And we go into investing extensively in that for anybody who's interested. I mean, well, there's so much I wanted to unpack as you were saying that, then you actually started answering my questions <laughs> as you carried on. That's brilliant. Well, one thing I do want to say, can we discuss the different types of investments a little bit more? Because this is part of the finance industry that is constantly changing, isn't it? Yeah, so when you start investing in the stock market, you broadly allocate your money across three main areas. So there are stocks, bonds and cash. So with stocks, this is high risk with the potential for higher returns. Um, with bonds, this is low risk and with low returns. So it provides an income and acts as a hedge for deflation, opposite of inflation. And it also helps to make uh, the bumpy ride of investing in stocks more smooth. And you tend to have more bonds in your portfolio if you're in a wealth preservation stage of your life, for example, if you're near a retirement. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you have cash. Now, this is no risk apart from inflation Mm -hmm. erading your purchasing power. Mm -hmm. And it's there to act as an emergency buffer. Mm -hmm. Um, It's also available if you take advantage of opportunities when markets fall, you have the cash. But this should be kept in an easily accessible account. Mm -hmm. For example, an easy access savings account. There are other types of assets that one can invest in. The key thing to realise is that Assets play different roles within a portfolio. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I want to just cover some of those. So stocks, for example, play the role of capital appreciation. So they, they can go up in value over time. Bonds play, play the role of capital preservation. They also act as a deflation hedge, as Mary mentioned. There are other things called real estate investment trusts, which is another way of investing in property. But rather than owning physical property, you own parts of a company that then invests in property, but you do it via the stock market. Mm -hmm. They're called REITs. So REITs, again, have that capital appreciation quality, but also provide diversification away from stocks themselves uh, traditionally. Then you've got commodities that are a different type of um, asset class. You're talking about about gold, silver, and those types of things. Commodities act as a way to diversify, but also they offer an inflation hedge. So you tend to see people buying gold and things like that as Mm -hmm. a way to hedge uh, during times of inflation. Then you've got, if you want to go a bit deeper, index funds and exchange traded funds, which I touched on earlier. Those, again, give you capital appreciation, but also offer diversification. And then if you wanted to touch on precious metals, those also offer you uh, an inflation hedge as well. And I just wanted to also touch on, you mentioned passive investing quite a lot. It sure. might be nice just to go into a little bit more detail about that. Mm-hmm. Passive investing differs to active investing. So active investing is where someone's typically making investing decisions for you. So traditionally, you give your money to uh, an investment manager or um, somebody who's effectively making the choice for you. Mm -hmm. And you typically um, have to pay quite an expensive fee for that choice that they're making for you. They're they're picking the, the, they're making investment decisions, the funds or the stocks that you're buying. However, with passive investing, you are, you're, first of all, you're making those decisions, but you're investing in funds that are, uh, are low cost and funds that are typically focusing on index funds and exchange traded funds of the type is where they structure. They're effectively trackers that track a particular market, particular index. So for example, the S&P 500 or the FTSE 100 or uh, the FTSE All Share Index and so on. And because of this, because no one's, because there isn't an additional layer of somebody else, you're making that decision yourself. You're you're choosing those particular investments, and because they're low cost, you give yourself the opportunity to get the market's return because you're not trying to beat the market necessarily. Whereas active managers are typically trying to beat the market, and most of them actually don't. Mm. Yeah. So what you find, in fact, there was I read recently in the Financial Times. I think we we crossed a, a moment where. The total amount of money in passive funds now exceeds the total amount of money in active funds. Really? It's a recent article. Uh, So you can see the direction of travel. More people, I believe, are gaining more confidence Mm. to take the step with their own investing and take control of their future wealth wealth opportunities. And we tend to say that if somebody is starting out, then you should really start off with passive investing. Mm -hmm. It it depends on what your risk appetite is, but we would definitely um, lean more towards the passive investing because there's lower risks in that area compared to 
sector active investing. So, so much great advice so far. Well, we'll have more on sustainable investing and some fairly big developments in that space, as well as more of the do's and don'ts of investing all on the way after this short break. Scammers are stealing hundreds of millions of pounds every year. They bombard us with fraudulent texts, emails and calls. And what's more, their tactics are getting increasingly sinister. To keep across the latest scams, sign up to our free Scam Alert service to help you stay ahead of the latest scams and protect yourself. Go to witch.co.uk forward slash scam alert dash newsletter. That's witch.co.uk forward slash scam alert dash newsletter. Thank you. Next up, we're going to hear from witch investing expert Megan Thomas. Now, recently, the Financial Conduct Authority announced new anti-greenwashing rules for investments and savings. She's been telling us more. At the moment, if you've decided you're ready to invest and you want specifically to pick an ethical fund, you'll find hundreds of funds saying they are green, they're responsible, they're sustainable, or they're ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social and Governance, which kind of just means they take into consideration the planet, human rights, um, lobbying, things like that. So you'll see all these funds with all these words attached, but they kind of don't mean anything at the moment. Actually, what they often mean is that a fund is taking into account how climate change might affect how well the fund does, but not actually how the things you invest in might impact the climate. Luckily, the Financial Conduct Authority, or the FCA, they've recognised this issue and they've launched a new anti-greenwashing rule that's coming into effect at the end of May. So this new rule will mean funds, as well as other products, actually like savings accounts um, and things like that, they will have to provide a justification for using these terms. So they won't be able to just call things sustainable, um, kind of on a whim. You have to provide the evidence that they actually have the sustainability credentials to match the names that they're giving. And Megan also mentioned more about the introduction of new green labels to some of these financial products and how they might work. The anti-greenwashing rule is all about letting you cut through that sort of greenwashing noise. But once you get to that, there can be quite a big difference in the ethical work that each fund is doing. So starting at the end of July this year, they'll be introducing four labels. So the first, sustainability impact, is funds that invest in assets directly making a positive impact. The second, sustainability focus, which is funds that invest in assets meeting a robust evidence-based standard of sustainability. Sustainability improvers, which is funds that invest in assets that have the potential to meet a robust evidence-based standard of sustainability, but maybe don't yet. So your investment in them will help them move towards that goal. And then finally, sustainability mixed goals, which is funds that invest using a mix of the above styles. So maybe some of them are impact companies, some of them are companies that they're trying to improve. And the aim of these labels is that you know yourself which types of funds you're interested in investing in. And so you can see quite clearly what type of fund it is and say, yes, that's what I think of when I think of ethical investing and that's what I want to invest in. So starting at the end of July, you'll be able to look out for those and pick the right investment for you. Very long awaited news there. And we'll have to touch base on this again after July and see how these new labels are doing in practice. Now, coming back to you, Mary and Ken in the studio, we've just been talking about green investing and some pretty big developments there. If we talk about this kind of ethical investing, it'd be great to get your thoughts on whether you can still be ethical while making decent returns on your money. I think that there is a balance that needs to be struck between your desire to invest driven by your values and the type of performance you're willing to accept when it Mm -hmm. comes to investing. Compared to, I mentioned the S&P 500 earlier, compared to the S&P 500, ethical funds will most likely underperform as some of them charge slightly higher fees and exclude companies that profit from some questionable activities. Uh, However, if you're prepared to accept those uh, accept slightly lower performance for a better world, then you can expect to invest much more intentionally and confidently led by your values. Uh, In our book, I mentioned earlier, we did some research into uh, ethical investing specifically to compare Mm -hmm. performance of those funds to more mainstream uh, indexes like the S&P 500. And we looked at a particular fund called the UBS MSCI World Socially Responsible UCITS ETF. And that particular fund over 10 years had generated a, generated a return of 138.6% compared to 229% 
of the S&P 500. So you can mm. see you're generating quite significant returns over 10 years, even with you know, the fact that you've, you know, you've stripped out a lot of the, you know, the things that people are, are now becoming much more conscious of. Mm. However, there is still a lag in performance, which I think, to be honest with you, is a bit of a shame. You know, I do, I do want to get to a world where one day you're able to say I'm, I'm investing in an ethical fund, but it's, it's not giving me a materially different performance compared mm. to investing, say, in the S&P 500. 500. Yes, I mean, that would be the dream, wouldn't it? To just know that you're investing in something that you believe in. Yes, absolutely. And now just before we finish for today, I just want to talk a little bit about what you call a 12 day roadmap. And it's something that you've made to help anyone like the people listening to this show today uh, looking to start on their investing journey. Without giving away too much, is there anything we haven't covered today uh, so far on the show that you think could be worth giving a mention? How to become a millionaire by investing £10 a day. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I want to Tell go into, me more. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go into that because I think it's important to almost hang on to some really important insights as a way to encourage you with investing. So I'm going to lay out some thoughts here. So investing £10 a day or £300 a month is an amount that most people can relate to even on lower disposable incomes. Okay, so let's assume that you invested this amount in the S&P 500 or in a low cost global index fund, generating an average return of 8% before inflation. Over a period of 40 years, you would return a total final investment amount of £1,054,284. And that includes contributions in terms of monthly deposits, so how much you've actually put in of 144000 This is what you put into it. But the vast majority of that £1,054,000 thereabouts return comes from compounding interest. Mm. £910,000 is coming from money working over time. Just think about it. This really just illustrates, uh, it demonstrates the power of placing money in the right environment, first of all. So rather than living in your bank account, putting in a place where it generates some kind of return and also the power of money working and money over time. In addition, it demonstrates something really powerful, which is the opportunity cost of every pound that's wasted and not invested. Mm. Just to explain a bit more, assuming you had a 7% return on average, every pound you don't invest would have doubled to two pounds in 10 years if you had invested it. Just think about that. So starting to invest money, even with spare change in your pocket, will be worth your while in years to come. I just want to know a little bit more about what that would look like day to day. So you're putting mm-hmm. £10 pounds away every mm-hmm. day. Are you, you know, monitoring your different investments and moving things around, like moving the money around? How would you, you know, what kind of advice would you have there on, on the kind of, you know, managing your own investments and, and how to monitor as you're putting in the money every day? Yeah, we wouldn't say that you should monitor it every day or mm-hmm. even every week for that matter, mm-hmm. because it could cause unnecessary stress, especially with the fluctuations in the stock market at the moment. So what we would say is just to see it as a long term goal and it's a you're playing a long game invest your money and just leave it in there. You can review it, you know, on a monthly basis to see how it's performing. But provided you've done your research, you've done your due diligence, um, we would say invest it, leave it in there and see it increase over time. There's some really interesting research around what type of investor has the best returns over time. And this may shock people to know that that investor, they found out that the people who have the best returns over time are actually dead people because they never got to log into their accounts. Mm. They didn't sell, they didn't do anything. When there were there was a lot of noise in the media, they just kept quiet, they just didn't do anything during their lifetimes, right? Mm. So the point there, really extending what Mary's saying is, is the less you tinker with your investments, the better, mm. because every time you sell and buy and sell, you're paying fees. And of course, with benefits from those fees, they go to companies, they didn't just mm. disappear into the internet. So that's money coming out mm. of your portfolio. Yeah. But the point about the £10 a day, we use that as an il- illustration because everyone can relate to £10 a day. Yeah. You know, like coming into the, doing this podcast, I just spend £5 buying breakfast, right? Mm. You know, so if you think £10 a day over 30 days is I mean, it £300. Could be £10 pounds. a week or it could yeah. be £10 it's, a month. Could, could be anything. Yeah. yeah, it could be anything, right? But the point is, and because we all get, most people get paid monthly, if you're able to budget that amount and put it aside, and but not just leave it in your bank account, but put it in the right environment mm. by investing it, 
and then forgetting about it because you're thinking long term that money has that potential to grow over time. Some really inspirational stuff we've covered. Now, um, just to finish, um, I should say we have a whole host of great investing advice on the Witch website too. And I'll pop a link to our guide in the description for today's episode, along with our research looking at the best and worst investment platforms as ranked by us. Although I should mention, you have to be a member to see those results in full. And you can sign up by heading to witch.co.uk forward slash join. Uh, it's been so, so brilliant to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank, Thank you Thank so you very much. much for having us. Well, a huge thank you again to Ken and Mary and to Megan too for coming on the show today and to you for listening to this week's episode of the Witch Money Podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, please do hit subscribe to make sure you catch our new episodes as soon as they drop. For daily money news and advice, you can find us on social media at Witch Money and online at witch.co.uk forward slash money. And we also have a free money newsletter, which is delivered to your inbox every Monday. To sign up, visit witch.co.uk forward slash money newsletter. This episode of the Witch Money Podcast was written and presented by me, Lucia Ariano, produced by me and Rob Lilly-Jones and edited by James Rowe. What is happening to supermarket prices? Do own label brands taste good? What's the best supermarket? What's the worst? How do I spend less on my weekly shop? Are there ways I can shop smarter? Should I just be growing my own veg? How do I even grow veg? <sighs> Wine to pair with spag ball? When life gives you questions, get answers at witch.co.uk.